Guys, let's hit the like button. It helps JCM's channel. Is this work related, Todd? It's Zep related. So here we are, midway through the decade 1995. I was in second grade and an old soul who enjoyed a year of great movies. Cable TV and VHS rental stores made this 90s kid real happy. Subtitle movies were some of the best English teachers for a lot of us. I still remember being in line with my mom to watch Toy Story, and later with both my parents for Jumanji at the Bella Vista Theater, which nowadays sits in ruins. Abandoned cinemas make me quite sad for a reason. The experience of a movie theater was a great escape for a child, quite a rock and roll event. My music playlist back then revolved around two albums really, Michael Jackson's History with my favorite track, Stranger in Moscow. The Beatles' Blue album was a world of its own, while the Red album was fun, with more accessible tunes for a kid. Yet the Blue album felt more interesting and deep. While there were small shopping centers in my country's capital, we finally got a taste of the American tradition in 1995, the year of the first multi-story mall. Mall San Pedro, Mall San Pedro, or St. Peter Mall. Like a ripple effect from NAFTA, the emerging call center workforce of a small percentage of bilingual citizens created a new city within our city. A new type of consumer was developing. Advertising agencies aimed at the young adult Generation X and infant millennials to take the lead of a pay-per-view life we nowadays remember as the golden years when we were smarter than our phones. St. Peter Mall had three shopping floors and lots of office rental space, which hosted one little dark secret behind the booming call center business in my country, sportsbooks. Everybody, and I mean most bilingual employees, worked there at some point in the 90s. Speaking English was a precious commodity back then and it paid good money, but still it was like a third from what was paid in the US. It shaped the city's economy more than people like to admit, from college students to musicians, physicians, lawyers, you name it. They took calls from US customers and learned a thing or two about sports in the process. These businesses provided lucrative job opportunities governments nor local employers could offer. The telephone line gold rush was real. The call center effect created new hobbies and tastes for technology. Texas Hold'em Poker, Sushi, MTV, buying a Page and Plants VHS, or importing avant-garde CD titles like The Sporting Life. Spending in Spanish and laughing in English became a thing. Millennial kids took note of Gen Xers making boomer money above the average college graduate. These were the stepping stones for digital greed, fast food madness, and immediacy. There was no turning back. I loved the pretzel joint and a small basketball card stand on the third floor of Mall San Pedro, 1995. A salty pretzel and a Michael Jordan basketball card was all I needed. I never thought I would be there 10 years later in my first call center job doing fast food surveys on the phone. You cross your fingers a customer didn't say they knew McDonald's as it made the whole thing 45 minutes long. Reaching out to people in the US for a quick market research study was quite a call center odyssey. I never worked in a sports book out of former employee stories of violence, armed bosses, and after hours bilingual decadent lifestyles. Fast forward 2006, and the Department of Justice shut down the largest sports book in Mall San Pedro. They gave them no quarter. It made international headlines. It ended thousands of headsets. This was point break for the local call center industry shifting towards customer services for American corporations away from shady ventures. I bought houses of the holy, physical graffiti, and the song remains the same VHS at Mall San Pedro. Writing the script, listening to Michael Jackson's Earth song brought back memories of me playing Street Fighter 2, Turtles in Time, and 1995 was a year of city riches and shopping mall selections, while the Page and Plan Corporation got ready to cash in the great marketing efforts of nostalgia inducing tensions. Um, also, thank you, my friends, for finally remembering my phone number. Thank you. Bye. Exclusion of uh, John Paul Jones, uh, an obvious sort of. Shut up. <laughs> no. <laughs> an obvious. Oh, it don't matter. It's just that Jonesy was busy and we're busy. 
Menos Bass. I just turn too much bottom don't end. Don't ask, don't, don't, because it's a different game. Do you want some reverb, mate? A little reverb. Do you want some? Amigo, poco reverb. Yeah, how much do you want? Quantos minutos? No, 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 no. Oh, in the, in the truck? In the camionetta? Vale. Okay. Aquí, hombre. Donde? Ahora? Terminado. Finito. Uno más? Uno más? Con football? Con todos? Okay. Here's a new song. Both Jimmy and Robert recorded an acoustic radio session in Argentina that never aired. This is the city where Paige met who many in the Zeppelin world referred to as Jimmy's Brazilian girlfriend, but in reality, she was American. Jimena Gomez Paracha was born on November 7, 1972 in San Francisco, California. Her parents were Argentinian. She spent a few years in Spain and Argentina. Why am I talking about her? It's a very important part of the Page and Plant story of 1996, so bear with me. Jimena Gomez arrived in Salvador, state of Bahia, Brazil, when she was 20. There she met a musician by the name of Luciano Silva, a sax player for local acts including the rock band Bichos. They had a daughter but the relationship didn't work out and split. Fast forward 1994 and Jimena met Jimmy at a local TV station in Argentina where Paige and Plant gave an interview. They stayed in touch all through the media tour dates in Brazil where Paige was shocked at the social injustice faced by children of poor neighborhoods. He got involved with a non-profit organization as a way of helping them out. Jimena and Jimmy bonded over this matter. Page divorced his second wife Patricia Ecker in early 1995 and later married Jimena. Three years later, in 1969, I saw Led Zeppelin perform at the Boston Tea Party. They ran out of songs after they played their whole first album. Backstage, the guys watched Joe Perry and Steven Tyler with Steven throwing the opening line for Zeppelin's Good Times, Bad Times. In the days of my youth, I told what it was to be alive. The anecdotes made Paige smile. The others felt the silent truths and his story tales move ever so invisible, fleeting, and mysterious. Feeling somewhat nervous in front of the camera backstage as they listened to Ahmed Ertigan's speech, Jumpla Jones's presence was striking, and he was planning his next move. Just a glimpse of him was a powerful image. The distance between Plan and Jason Bonham speaks of a personal wound, quote Jason Bonham. And then when they actually got back together in 1995, that devastated me, that they got Michael Lee to play drums. That wasn't a good time for me, I don't know why. It was having to explain myself to people. Why didn't they get you? Aren't you good enough? I had a conversation with Robert about that many years later. I said that was a really tough time for me to understand. Jimmy Page loved every minute of his second time of the event after his 1992 induction with the Yardbirds. In between feeling nervous and honored, it was full circle for his legacy in the eyes of the rock and roll institution at the gates of a world tour with Robert Plant. Plant was first with a very Robert Plant style speech focusing on the relationship with Ahmed Ertigan. He addressed an alleged 1975 rehearsal at Manticore Studios owned by Emerson Lake and Palmer. So um, it was a pretty shitty place. Uh, it belonged to Emerson Lake and Palmer. <laughs> and, uh, but we got a good rate on it. Ha! <laughs> Well, there's actual photographs from the 1977 session there. Maybe Robert got his fax mix up to 1975. His Herman Hermit's joke probably sealed his destiny minutes later. Being English and having to put up with Herman's Hermits wasn't much fun. And uh, even though John Paul Jones did play with them for a bit. <clears throat> oh, New York Times today? No. And uh, honored to have with us uh, Jason and Zoe Bonham. We've got to split the award between them. 
It's going to be interesting. And uh, Next was Jimmy Page with a quick and nervous delivery. This, I must say, it's a great honour to be inducted. Actually, it's the second time for me, because actually earlier when I was inducted with the Arbors, and it's almost like inducted, induced, and this time it's the forceps, and uh, <laughs> some of you will get that. But anyway, uh, thank you very much, everybody. And then, John Paul Jones waited no time and approached the microphone. It looks like Robert thought Bonzo's children, Zoe and Jason Bonner, were next. Jones tried to play it cool, but he knew right there, a moment in history was to be made. Uh, yes, thank you. I'd just like to add also my thanks to Peter Grant, who gave us the freedom to do what we did. And um, also, thank you, my friends, for finally remembering my phone number. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Jason's speech was emotional, with his sister holding him by his side. Listening to them, obviously my father for being one of the greatest rock and roll drummers of all time, and this one's for him, and he'd be very proud. Thank you very much. Past Robert's MC-style closing, Jones was left in the middle with no real contact from Paige nor Plant. Their body language says it all. Page Plan Jones and Jason Bonham performed a five song set list at the event. Technically the third Led Zeppelin reunion, it was a sort of consolation prize for the concert lineup that was not to be in future Page and Plan agendas. Plan doesn't look relaxed with Jones on stage. While it wasn't as tense as Live Aid 1985 nor Atlantic 1988, there's a slight disconnection going on. As much as Jones tries to join them, the division is visible. First off, they played four songs with Steven Tyler and Joe Perry, including a historic performance of Train Kept It Rolling, which the Led Zeppelin surviving members hadn't played since John Bonham's last show on July 7th, 1980. It was also the first Led Zeppelin song they played together back in the famous Gerard Street rehearsal room in 1968. Robert Plant added the words for the Arberts number For Your Love on the outro, in a similar style to Zeppelin's early 1969 medleys. Next, the band went into Bring It On Home. While Led Zeppelin did the intro on the 1973 US tour, they hadn't played the song in full since June 25th, 1972 at the LA Forum, which we can hear on the album How The West Was Won. The two guitar attack of Page and Perry was a hard rocking wall of sound backed up by Jones's heavy groove. The way he kept his cool throughout the show without missing a single note is impressive. The remainder of the set was comprised of several old school blues numbers with great interplay by the musicians on stage. While the audio mix was not the best, it provides a good snapshot of what it was. Last track on the set featured none other than Neil Young, whom Jimmy shared the stage with in 1974 and 1992, when the Levy Breaks was performed with a similar guitar riff to the 1994 unleaded version. Michael Lee on drums may have something to do with it. Page, Plan and Jones had not performed this track since January 20th, 1975 at the old Chicago Stadium. Pay close attention to John Paul Jones' thundering bass with Michael Lee's drumming. The Page and Plan tours could have been so much better with Jonesy. Just listen to that bass presence. The guitar hero here was not Paige, but Neil Young going madman crazy on stage, as Plant grabbed a Les Paul and played along. And that was that. No more Paige, Plant and Jones on stage until 12 years later, almost the same length as Led Zeppelin's entire career.
mile ahead. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Right, the beat was rock and roll, and today's edition of the E.T. Gazette does the honors. Last night in New York, the Allman Brothers Southern Style Sound was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Other honorees, Al Green, Martha and the Vandellas, Led Zeppelin, and original grunge rocker Neil Young. Lou Reed inducted the late Frank Zappa, while Melissa Etheridge rocked to the memory of Janis Joplin. Zeppelin was very interesting because we had our ears open and we would play literally what we heard. And, uh, we were shielded um, by Peter Grant, the manager, from um, a lot of outside pressures. Yeah. And uh, it's a, you know, a, a very, um, a very good position. It's a bit of work than that. It's a very good position to be in because we didn't have to worry about what anybody else thought. Oh, we didn't have to worry about oh, let's make a record like the last one. And so we just did what we wanted. You know, and off it went and was released. You know, <laughs> Those are the days. Nice work if you can get it, I tell you. <laughs> is the shark story true or is it all just like mythology? Oh, none of it's true. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I remember you know, all sorts of things and a lot of things I don't remember, <laughs> funny enough. <laughs> but, uh, yes, there, there was, there was a, a sort of menagerie roll. <laughs> cool hat and of course it's embroidered with the swan song logo on the front and then it's got the name uh, Led Zeppelin right on the side of it this you've got the Led, Led Zeppelin box set two compact disc and uh, you're getting a couple of them right here no I'm buying the uh, 10 CD box set for my son as a surprise for his birthday man how old is he he'll be 32 this month oh no kidding good for you well, he'll be thrilled. He, he knows nothing of this, and he's just going to lose it when he opens this one. He's going to love it. Yeah, Led Zeppelin is his all-time favorite, and I really paid my dues when he was a kid growing up in this house listening to this endlessly. Because you had to listen to things like this? Oh, sure. Yeah? That's great. Yeah. Well, let's yeah, pay uh, some more dues. <laughs> John Paul Jones has been busy producing and arranging for top artists, but retains his reputation as one of music's best bass players. Let's turn to London via satellite where they're rehearsing for their February world tour. The American Music Awards honors Jimmy Page, Robert Plant, John Paul Jones, and John Bonham with his International Artist Award for Led Zeppelin, January the 30th, 1995. Accepting in London are Jimmy Page, Robert Plant, and for John Bonham, his son, Jason. Primal rock and roll, and it came from America. Jason? Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank, um, <laughs> see Robert, Jimmy, John Paul, um, for creating music that gave the space uh, for my father so he could play the way he did, and thanks for remembering him. And James, thank you very much indeed. It's an honor. That's all you're going to get from me. <laughs> and here in Los Angeles to accept the award is the third surviving member of Led Zeppelin, John Paul Jones. Nice to work with you, Tom, again. When was the last time, right? Delilah or Greengrass or Home? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah exactly. I'll do it again. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very proud to be part of, to my mind, the greatest band in the world. Um, also to have uh, worked with the greatest drummer, John Bonham. I wish you were here. And I'd like to thank my wife, Mo, for being my inspiration and putting up with both me and rock and roll. <laughs> thank you, Mo. Thank you all. Bye. It is E10604. That is your choice of page plant, no quarter, the music on cassette, on vinyl, and on CD, anywhere from $13 to $17. We still have that available. This is that 10 CD box set. And if you are on the line, please stay there because you've got the complete recordings, all digitally remastered. Quote, I'm back. That's all Jordan said on Saturday. That was really all Jordan needed to say as his 17-month retirement came to an end. He will be back on Sunday when the Bulls play the Pacers. And encomium is a Latin word deriving from the ancient Greek encomium, meaning the praise of a person or thing. Encomium, a tribute to Led Zeppelin, was released on March 12th, selling half a million copies. Track 1, Tonto en la Lluvia, which is Spanish for Fool in the Rain, was played by Mexican rock band Maná. 
By 1995, these guys had several hit singles that became Latin rock staples for the region and one album away from scoring huge success worldwide. It was a great choice for them to play this song as it featured their chops, especially those by drummer Alex Gonzalez. The final selection with the mariachi arrangement was brilliant. Their lead singer, Fer Olvera, had sort of a Robert Plant vibe going on. Some say he's a poor man's Robert Plant. La versión económica de Roberto Planta. I'm Linda Perry, and I'm in a band called Four Non Blondes. Track two, Misty Mountain Hop, was done by Four Non Blondes, featuring pop. I want to turn it off. Track 5, Dancing Days by the Stone Temple Pilots, took Houses of the Holy to unplugged sounds that rival Unleaded. As you know, I'm not a fan of the Led Zeppelin Studio version because of its harsh EQ mixing, but this cover is my favorite version. There, I said it. Of course, I like Led Zeppelin's live versions, but this one is very special. Props to these guys, they made their song their own grunge anthem. Track 6, Tangerine by Big Head Todd and the Monster, was a logical choice as their 1993 hit single Bittersweet had a similar musical style. Track 7, Thank You, by Duran Duran, is, well, a masterpiece. The sudden reinvention of their 1993 album makes this cover a heartfelt arrangement you wish Page and Plan played on the Unleaded tour. Next songs, Out in the Tiles, Good Times, Bad Times, Custard Pie and Four Sticks are forgettable. And just for the record, I think the best Good Times, Bad Times cover was played by Nuclear Assault in 1988. Track 12, Going to California, I'm not sure what to say here. They took a Led Zeppelin song and turned it into Broadway theater stuff. It's forgettable and horrible. Track 13 is a treasure of the album. Not only were Robert Plant and Tori Amos dating in real life for a while, their interpretation of Down by the Seaside is a journey of its own. I like to think this is what Annette could have been had Robert Plant gone solo, instead of calling Jimmy Page. Traces of Tori Amos' exquisite takes on Zeppelin can be seen on her Live at Montreux 1991-1992 DVD with Hola Love and Thank You. This is the sort of album you find in casual Zeppelin fan collections. It also speaks of weekend warrior denial and yuppie lifestyles. And Commune was a sort of grunge rite of passage that now seems lost in time. I don't trust people who choose this as their go-to Zeppelin album. They're psychopaths if you ask me.